This is a story about reputation, discourse, and online contemporary art magazines. We can begin with reputation, a most elusive character. According to some in evolutionary biology, having a reputation encourages altruism, thereby giving our genes a better chance to survive. According to some within psychology, Reputation is a part of our public selves that exists in dialogue with our private selves. In studies of corporate reputation, it has been constituted as a publicly seen image, understood as an asset to be managed. The literature on artistic reputation locates it somewhat differently. For some within this literature, it is based on the intrinsic qualities of artworks, for others, on social structures. Some have shown how it is embedded in the mechanics of the market, others have looked at how it is affected by processes such as globalization and commercialization. Arguably, the most robust account of reputation to date is Pierre Bourdieu's field theory, which he applied to cultural fields such as art and literature. Here, an agent's reputation is based on their recognition by others in the field. What agents in a field recognize in each other is different forms of capital. Economic capital, such as money, and cultural capital, such as their education. The more capital an agent has, the higher they are positioned in the field, shown here by the y-axis. Their position along the x-axis of the field is also important and depends on the composition of this capital. The more it is composed of economic forms of capital, such as property or advertising revenue, the closer an agent is positioned to the commercial pole of the field, the pole which produces for a broad audience. The more it is composed of cultural forms of capital, such as awards and peer recognition, the closer an agent is positioned to the cultural pole of the field, the pole which produces for a restricted audience. So very simply put, for Bourdieu, artistic value is socially constructed based on oppositions between cultural and commercial production. Although Bourdieu wrote about how language functions to reproduce such divisions in society, he did not explain how agents' possession of capital is communicated, how reputation is constructed through discourse. In fact, barring a handful of exceptions, there is an almost complete neglect of discourse within the literature on artistic reputation. We can address this gap in the research by combining Pierre Bourdieu's field theory with Norman Fairclough's dialectic relational approach to discourse analysis. When examining systems of classification, a useful place to start is modifiers. By modifiers, we mean words or phrases that function like adjectives, that attach meaning to another word or phrase. This story is about how online contemporary art magazines use modifiers to represent artists. It's a story about a discursive limit which prohibits the explicit evaluation of artists and a discursive norm which constructs artists' reputations through their ethnicity and nationality. This story is taken from the pages of the online contemporary art magazines Art Forum, Art News, Eflux and Artsy. The story moves between two different corpora taken from these magazines' websites. The website corpus was compiled from each of the magazine's websites and contains approximately 4 million words. In order to determine statistical significance, this corpus was compared with N101013, a 20 billion word corpus of online discourse compiled from a wide variety of different websites. In order to examine the findings from the website corpus more closely, an article corpus was compiled comprised of three art news reviews and three eFlux announcements, and both magazines about pages. It contains approximately 4,000 words. The story begins with how evaluative and descriptive modifiers construct reputational value. 
It ends by revealing the norms and limits surrounding these modifiers. We begin with the example of the evaluative modifier leading, taken from Eflux's about page. The statement reads, who uses Eflux? Nearly all the leading art museums, biennials, cultural centers, magazines, publishers, art fairs, and independent curators worldwide. Looking at it in context, we see that leading is applied through the semantic relations of the list to all of the institutions listed, even those belonging to the and others subcategory, which is a hierarchical construction in itself. Here, leading functions as a classification, representing these institutions as occupying dominant positions in the field of art, and implicitly, by stating that they use efflux, constructing efflux's position as well. Such schemes function to communicate the reputational hierarchy of the field, thereby working to reproduce or transform it. To examine how a descriptive modifier can be evaluative, we can look at semantic prosody. Semantic prosody basically refers to whether a word has a positive, negative or neutral connotation. Modifiers acquire prosody through their cotext and context. Cotext refers to the meanings created by accompanying words and context refers to the meaning implied by the context of production and interpretation. In the cases discussed here, the context is informed by the dominant value system in the field of contemporary art. It's worth noting that the modifiers in the article corpus had a very high rate of positive semantic prosody, demonstrating how frequently the descriptive modifiers in art news reviews and efflux announcements are implicitly evaluative. In fact, this level of positive prosody suggests that these texts are more promotional than journalistic. To first get an idea of a normal use of evaluative modifiers, we can look at the most salient modifiers associated with the nouns artist, author, actor, musician and writer within the N101013 corpus, which can be seen as representative of text outside the field of art. That is, it can be seen to demonstrate how different text producers, in general, use words like artist. These modifiers are sorted into categories. The categories identified were national ethnic, age, evaluative, gender and type. The national ethnic category contained terms such as local and international. Age contained terms such as young. The evaluative category includes terms like famous, talented and renowned. And type was the broadest category, including terms like visual, contemporary and makeup. Looking at these results, we can see that for all these agents, evaluative modifiers are very salient, second only to modifiers of type. Moving to the magazine's websites, focusing solely on the word artist, we can see that evaluative modifiers are much less salient. This suggests that there may be discursive limits at work in these magazines, whereby the use of evaluative modifiers is regulated. The other big difference between the N101013 corpus and the website corpus is the magazine's predominant use of national and ethnic modifiers, but we'll return to that in a moment. First, we return to the article corpus to get another perspective on the use of evaluative modifiers. This chart illustrates the different modifiers used to represent artists, artworks, exhibitions and institutions in the eight texts. These modifiers were again sorted into the categories that best describe them, the categories being descriptive, emotive, evaluative and comparative. The descriptive category contains modifiers such as huge, surreal and wild. The emotive category worried, anxious and fearful. The evaluative category wonderful, extraordinary and powerful and the two comparative modifiers were oldest and more raw. The first thing to see is that only 5 out of the 74 modifiers used were applied to artists. Secondly, they are all descriptive and none of them are evaluative. With 51 modifiers applied to artworks and only 5 applied to artists, 
we might think that the texts are talking more about the artworks than the artists. But if we look at the verbs used in these articles, artists are nearly as present as artworks. The findings from the article corpus suggest that modifiers may be seldom applied to artists in these magazines and support the finding from the website corpus that, when they are, they are rarely evaluative. This points to a discursive limit which regulates their use. From a Bourdieusian perspective, this limit can be seen as based on historically constituted oppositions between art and practices such as advertising. This is the opposition between culture and commerce, between disinterest and self-interest. Simply put, for online contemporary art magazines, even if the function of the text is promotion, they can't completely reveal that promotion is the goal, as perhaps an excessive use of evaluative modifiers might signal. To adhere to the norms of the field, their goal should appear to be, primarily at least, the development and appreciation of contemporary art. This means that their discourse must be carefully managed so that their motivations appear cultural rather than commercial. Coming back to the five descriptive modifiers that were applied to artists in the article corpus, we can see the pattern concerning national and ethnic modifiers continues. Of the five modifiers applied to artists, four adhere to this category. The salience of these modifiers in both the website and the article corpora indicates that their use constitutes a norm. This then raises the question as to whether they are performing a purely descriptive function or not. Returning to the context, we can look at some literature on artistic reputation to get an insight. Jonathan Harris has noted how the contemporary art world is tied to the virtues of multiculturalism and globalization, and, paraphrasing Jean Fisher, notes how artists' cultural difference has become more readily marketable. Similarly, Elizabeth Currid notes how place affirms the legitimacy and value of a cultural good and the artist who created it, how it brands the cultural good. Drawing on Bourdieu's concept of cultural capital, the interpretation we are therefore proposing is that national and ethnic modifiers can construct artists' reputations by performing their cosmopolitanism. That is, that cosmopolitanism is a form of cultural capital in the field of contemporary art and that these modifiers communicate this value. To demonstrate how this functions at the level of text, these are some examples of performances of cosmopolitan capital taken from one of the efflux announcements. Born in Tunis in 1978, the Russian Tunisian artist grew up in Tunis, Kiev and Dubai. The way that the artist thinks and works is constantly being influenced by her perspective as a cosmopolitan. The first statement performs the artist's cosmopolitan capital by representing her place of birth, her dual nationality and her cosmopolitan upbringing. The second example more directly performs her cosmopolitan capital by representing its effect on her art practice. These examples also further illustrate how a seemingly neutral description can be implicitly evaluative, that such implicit evaluation can only be understood by attending to the value system of a specific field, and therefore that it cannot be understood by attending to linguistic data alone. This was a story about a discursive limit and a discursive norm at work in online contemporary art magazine discourse. In the end, there appears to be some prohibition of the use of evaluative modifiers to represent artists. This limit can be seen as based on, while reproducing, the opposition between cultural and commercial production. For art news and efflux, it can be seen to protect their reputations by positioning them as cultural rather than commercial producers. And finally, artists appear to be predominantly classified according to their nationality or ethnicity. Although perhaps appearing to play a purely descriptive role, we can see that these characteristics can construct artists' reputations by performing their possession of cosmopolitan capital. This norm can be seen as based on, while reproducing, the value of cultural difference in the art world. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the story.